All right. So we are going to dive into, I'd love for you to start with, how did you even come into this? Like you're a friendship expert. Like you might be like, that's a job. (laughs) How how do I become a friendship expert? I'd love for you to tell us how you got started with this. Um, that's so funny. You're not the first person I've said that. Um, so I would say like in my young twenties, I, Oh, sorry. I think I cut myself off for a sec. I accidentally clicked the mute button. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. In my young twenties, I really valued romance and romantic partnership. And especially as a woman felt like that's where my worth comes from. That's where my value comes from. And it wasn't working out at the time. So I was feeling really bad. And I ended up starting a group with my friends to heal. And it was our wellness group. So we met up every week, we cooked, we did yoga, we meditated, and it was so healing for me. And it really made me question this idea that I had in my head that romantic love is the only love that matters or is fulfilling. And I realized like, why doesn't this love matter? Why isn't it significant? Why isn't it valued? So that was really the start of my journey. I guess to just want to elevate platonic love as an equal form of love to all the other beautiful forms of love that we get in our lives. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And I feel like you you go through that season, right? Like the first time you get a boyfriend and you're all wrapped up in him and you forget about your other relationships or whatever your first relationship is, you get wrapped up in it. And then your friends are like, Hey, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we've all seen that. We've seen our friends. We're like, Oh, they have a new partner. We're not going to see them for a while. Yeah. Uh, but it is important to keep those relationships. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, getting into more romantic partnerships, just realizing how much it makes our romantic partnerships healthier when we have friends, like research actually finds that when we get into fights with our romantic partnership, it disrupts our stress hormone release, but not if we have good friends, for example. Hmm, that's super interesting. I love that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, well, and I'm excited to talk to you about it because I know that you are kind of focusing on teens, but I feel like so much is also paralleled in like your adult life too, because yeah, absolutely. I moved to Chicago as an adult I moved here five years ago and then got married, had kids and felt like it was really hard for me to make friends, find a community. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to to hear what you have to say about all of that. And, um, And I'd love to kind of dive into what, what we're seeing with teens now. Like, why is it hard for them to make friends? I feel like when I was a teenager, I guess you just did. I grew up in a small town though. So I just kind of grew up with so many of the same people around me. So it was Mm -hmm. kind of easy to maintain those friendships. Um, But then when I moved to Vegas, I was like, oh my gosh, this is a whole new world for me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's kind of fascinating how much of a, a crisis I think teenagers are in around finding human connection. And I would say it's a more recent crisis. Um, around the beginning of the 2010s, we saw that adolescents ages 18 to 24 actually had the best mental health of any age group. Now we see that they have the worst. And around 2012 was when the smartphone became very popular. And so technology, as much as we can use it to find connection and the link between technology use and loneliness, it's kind of complicated because it depends on how do you use it. When you use technology to reach out to people to meet in person, it can make you less lonely, but if you use it to replace social interactions, it makes you a lot more lonely. But we also see other things like smartphone use breaking down our levels of empathy, because to develop empathy, we need to look into people's eyes and understand what it is that they're feeling. And obviously, this is a a pivotal skill to develop early on in life when you're a teenager. And so now we're seeing like this generation of teens has sort of been lonelier than any other generation of teens before it. And we're also seeing the impact of this on their mental health overall, because, you know, loneliness connection is one of the biggest predictors of our mental health. Yeah, that's so interesting, especially when you're saying kind of you need to look into somebody's eyes in order to have this empathy. So can you not really get that like through watching somebody's video on Instagram? You know, it's interesting. The research on technology has actually found that in-person interaction is the sort of golden standard of connection. Video 
interaction is then level two, telephone level three, you know, texting level four. For us to, you know, this study basically found that if you're doing the same thing, but across these different platforms, it does affect your level of connectedness to one another. And so there's really no replacing in-person interaction, unfortunately, but I think a lot of us have sort of replaced it. And I think the trouble with social media is it gives us sort of like a, a pseudo connection. So we might not even realize how disconnected we are because we're seeing people on our social media, we're liking them, we know what's going on in people's lives. So it's, I think it, it doesn't always lend itself to us actually having awareness of just how disconnected or lonely we might actually feel. Mm -hmm. What's interesting that I've seen, um, even just with like family and distant relatives and stuff is how we find out about things through social media versus back in the day, we'd get a letter like from my aunt telling us that her, you know, that she's expecting a new grandbaby or our cousin would call and tell us. And now it's like an announcement on social media. And you're like, oh, like I'm just finding out with the rest of the world, what my family's doing. <laughs> Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of people have your response because actually like broadcasting a message on social media that you don't tell people individually is actually related to um, having poor relationship quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that because I've, <clears throat> I've felt that before, like even in a friendship, I found out something recently that a friend did and I'm like, how come she didn't call me? Like, exactly. I'm I, I would have sent a card. I, I wanted to be there for her. Like yeah. I would have sent a card. I wanted to you know, whatever I'm like, but I found out on Instagram, that's kind of hurtful. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people really do feel that way and, and wish that someone could be intentional about reaching out to them and telling them. I, sometimes I think about it as like the difference between confession and vulnerability, like vulnerability, the act of it makes us closer to one another, connects us. Like a lot of the times we get afraid of burdening people, but the research finds that in general, the more vulnerable we are, the more people like us, the more they feel connected to us. But I think confession is different. Confession is you're sharing something, but you're not really thinking about who's receiving it. Um, and so in that way, it's not relational. It's not because I feel this connection to you, I can share this. Because I trust you, I can share this. It doesn't convey to the other person that we value them in the same way. And I think a lot of times what we're doing on social media, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I think one of the ways that it can negatively impact our, our connections is that confession can happen and there can be less actual vulnerability happening in our relationships to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, <clears throat> so your book is called Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. Um, so it, it's a lot of everything that you've kind of said, just like empathy, connection, attachment, um, how does that all come into play and how can we relay that information to young adults, to teens? Like right now I have a niece that's uh, 11 and <clears throat> wait, is she, she's turning 12 this month. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. that's wild. Um, so she's turning 12 and she's had a hard time because she's the smallest in her class. And, um, just, you know, when you're a young girl feeling like everyone else, is getting boobs and I'm not. So yeah. like, how do I, how do I fit in? Like kind of feeling already small around everybody. And then somebody will make a comment like, oh, well, she's the shortest, you know, so whatever. So like how, how, what are some tips, I guess, that we can give our kids to help foster that attachment and connection and vulnerability with peers? Yeah, this is a great question. And first of all, I just want to validate that like, it's friggin' hard, you know, like, I feel like no time are people more mean than in the teenage years. And I feel like as an adult, if I had to be surrounded by groups of, of my teenage peers now, it would probably get to me. So I think the first thing we can do is like, validation and understanding, like, hey, it is hard being the smallest one in your class. And I know other people in your class are, are developing in ways that maybe you're not, and that can make you feel bad and that's understandable. And that's valid, um, really. But I think the, the thing that I like to convey to people when you're making friends is the importance of assuming people like you. And this may seem like, well, why should I do that if people actually don't like me? And Here's why. There's research on this concept called the acceptance prophecy, which is basically the idea that 
when researchers manipulated people to think that they'd be accepted, even though that wasn't true, people became open, friendlier, warmer, and then they actually were more accepted. And there's other research on a phenomenon called the liking gap that finds that when strangers interact, people underestimate how much the stranger actually likes them. So we all tend to have, and I think especially teenagers, this negativity bias, wherein we, we're hyper attuned to negative information about ourselves socially, and we don't take in positive information about ourselves socially. And what that does is it creates this cycle where I feel bad about myself. Now I'm closed off and shut down. Now people want to interact with me less and so on and so forth. And so that's why I, you know, I remember meeting someone who was super social and she was really good at making friends. And I was like, what did your mom tell you? And she's like, my mom said, everybody is waiting to interact with you. They just need you to initiate and say hi. So I think that's a message we want to give to our teenagers. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. And like you said, it's just that that stage can be super hard. And even if somebody is making a comment like that, that doesn't mean that they don't like you. Exactly. You know, I remember a kid telling me, I, I was probably close to my niece's age, 11 or 12, like making fun of my unibrow. And she was actually my best friend, <laughs> but, it, but it hurt my feelings. Right. Of course, I was like, yeah. I, I had no idea I had a unibrow at that point. Um, until she pointed it out. Then I went home and had my sister shave my eyebrow, oh. <laughs> which it took me years to grow them back. Um, <laughs> just like I shaved them like too far apart. So it was, I had to, to fill in those, but, um, <clears throat> but also just kind of knowing, like having that conversation of, even if somebody makes a comment about something like, oh, you're small or, Hey, you have a unibrow <laughs> doesn't mean that they don't necessarily not like you. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's a really great way to build resilience and also telling, helping your kids tune into signs of social acceptance because people that are most insecure, they develop this confirmation bias where they recognize only the times when people are, are rejecting them or excluding them, even if it's unintentional, even if they're not, you know, really excluding them. And they don't see the times when a friend reaches out to them or says, let's, you know, can you sit next to me or, you know, all of these other times where they're being more accepted. And so I think pushing your teen to say, you know, was there anyone maybe that was accepting you that you didn't necessarily notice right away? Like if you look back on your day, was there anyone else who was welcoming you that you didn't initially notice? Because there's this theory called about self-esteem it's called the sociometric theory of self-esteem, right? And often we think of self-esteem as, do I feel worthy? Do I feel valuable? But that theory actually argues that our self-esteem is our gauge of how much other people value us. So if we want to increase our self-esteem, it's about getting other people to value us. But not only that, it's about noticing when people value us. It's about assuming that people value us when a situation is ambiguous. Obviously, if someone's harming you, you know, don't keep moving in on that. But if it's ambiguous and you don't know, starting with that assumption, and that's what will increase your self-esteem. And when you increase your self-esteem, it, it, it's this, you know, this positive cycle where it's you know, easier to connect with people because you're more willing to be able to like, initiate interactions with people. Mm -hmm. That's such good information that can be carried into, again, kind of all stages and seasons of life as like in marriage parenting. Uh, cause I, I even will see that with my husband he is, he compliments me all the time. He always tells me what a great job I'm doing and all this. And then he'll say like one thing like, Oh, Hey, like how come this happened? Or, Oh, what? just like a stupid comment. And then I'm like, I'm the worst. <laughs> He's like, I literally tell you all the time how amazing you are. And like, you know what I mean? It's like so yeah. easy to like hone in on the one thing that's like not even, it, it, not even a big deal. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, well, I suck as a wife and a parent, like obviously. And he's right. like, I literally tell you constantly that you're awesome. So I don't <laughs> understand how <laughs> this happened. It's so our it's pesky easy. brains. They're oh, just yeah. like danger <laughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I feel like that's just like what you're saying makes sense in so many different seasons of life. Um, but then, so if, if our value is kind of based on how other people are seeing us, how can we kind of take that and change it to where it's not based on outside mm. validation? I would say it's 
kind of impossible to be completely invincible to other people's perceptions, but it's possible to get to a place where you are less affected. Mm -hmm. Um, But to be completely unaffected, I think as social creatures, that's, I don't know, I don't know if it's completely possible, but one of the, you know, the theories that's really based in my book is attachment theory, which basically, you know, there's these people that are securely attached and they are the people that are most resilient to how other people perceive them, right? They can handle, um, you know, being critiqued more than the other attachment styles, rejection more than the other attachment styles. When they're excluded, it doesn't affect them as much as other attachment styles. And really their secret, Elizabeth, so this is this is the complicated part, is that they have had close nourishing connections and they've internalized that into part of who they are. And that's how they've become more resilient and stronger in the future. So I would say part of being in a place where you're less affected by other people is building a really strong community of people that value you, of being intentional at, at, about taking in their love and appreciation, letting it impact your, your body, your feelings, your emotions, focusing on it, um, letting go of people who don't value you because people that have something called anxious attachment where they fear abandonment by others, They tend to cling to unhealthy relationships. They tend to cling to, they like having the ability to earn people's love and convince people. So they'll they'll keep trying with these people that are harmful to them. Part of becoming secure, part of developing positive self-esteem is letting go of those relationships that don't reflect the positive feelings you want to develop about yourself as well. So it's about like, I guess, developing your community and also curating your community so that you can develop a strong enough sense of self. Um, so that you're less affected by all of the the difficulties that life is going to throw your way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, community, community is huge and that makes sense. And again, I feel like I'm just taking everything you're saying and applying it to motherhood of like, how can I help my children develop like a deep caring attachment? Um, and since you've mentioned community, uh, I know that school situations can somehow provide that, but outside of that, is there ways to get your team to be a part of a community to help develop that and get the chance to be vulnerable with kids, especially if they're kind of feeling social isolation in school or whatever other situations that they're in? Yeah, certainly. So I think it's really important to get your your teenager involved in some sort of extracurricular activity The reason being that when you see people, there's this uh, sociologist, Rebecca Adams, and she says, friendship happens organically when we have continuous unplanned interaction and shared vulnerability. So when they sign up for an extracurricular activity, your teen is mostly getting that. They're seeing the same people over time. And when we see the same people over time, what happens is something called the mere exposure effect, which is our unconscious tendency to like people the more familiar they are. So your teen will come to like other people more, they'll come to like your teen more. So it's important to just remind your teen that at first it might be uncomfortable and you're gonna be a little more weary of people and they're gonna be weary of you, right? Because it's actually natural right at the beginning when people are unfamiliar to feel that way, to feel a little anxious, to feel a little scared. That doesn't mean that it's time to drop out. That means it's important to give it time and see where this relationship goes over time. So I think helping them get engaged in something that is repeated over time can be really, really important. And I think for parents too, one of the um, predictors of whether your kids make friends is whether they see you hanging out with your friends. So um, thinking about, you know, if you really want to help your kid be less isolated, are you making sure that you are also doing so for yourself and connecting with people, connecting with friends and modeling what healthy friendship looks like for your kids. Mm -hmm. I love that you said modeling what healthy friendship looks like for your kids uh, because they absorb so much more, like even at a young age than, than you think. And I think that that can be applied in so many ways. Like my daughter's two now and my husband and I have just realized she's listening to everything. So like you can't talk crap about somebody in front of her. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like if we're like, oh, did you hear like that? What happened with this person? And it's like, you don't want her. I'm like, I don't want her to hear me speaking like that. Mm -hmm. So starting like me even being like, wow, do I gossip too much? Like what's happening here? And, and being like, I don't want her to think that it's okay. Mm -hmm. 
listening to me saying something about whatever, you know, like, I'm like, so modeling that friendship, I feel like is so not just friendships, but the quality of them. Absolutely. It's nice that, you know, it's like a double whammy and that it can benefit you and then benefit your kids as well. Put you in check. (laughs) (laughs) That's for sure. Um, I'd love for you to talk about the, um, the study of the four women that were planted in a classroom. Cause I think that that's so cool. Yeah. So this is kind of one of the formative studies that, um, led for, to researchers to develop this idea of the mere exposure effect, wherein they had four women that were not part of a psychology class, a big psychology lecture. And they asked these women, Hey, you, she should go to the psychology class for a certain number of classes. One of the women, she didn't show up to any another woman. She showed up to most of the classes. And at the end of the semester, the researchers showed pictures of the woman to the students in the class and said, hey, how much do you like this woman? You may not even know, but just based on her picture, you may not know her, remember her, but based on this picture, how much do you feel like you like her? And what the researchers actually found is that the woman that had shown up to the most classes was like the most, even though most people did not remember who she was. And the woman who showed up to no classes was like the least. And this was about a 20% difference. So it was quite significant. And so, you know, the implications of the study, again, is the mere exposure effect. If we can just show our face, we don't even have to say anything. But what just by becoming someone that's familiar, we build trust with people. We get people to like us more. Hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's crazy to me how people like researchers are like, let's try this thing out. Like, how do they come up with these studies and different things that they're going to do? Um, but it's so cool to like hear those findings and to know all of that. But like, who's, who's sitting there like thinking, this is how we're going to research this. This is how we're going to come up with this study. Um, but I mean, it's interesting. That's, that's so cool. Um, So I know on your Instagram that you share tons of information, tons of free tips and things like that. I'd love to maybe touch on, um, you've recently shared things that can maybe potentially harm our relationships. And uh, again, I know your book and stuff is kind of focusing on teens. So in in that demographic, what are things that could potentially be harmful to friendships that we're trying to build. Yeah. Yeah. So the book actually focuses more on adults, but I think a lot of the the principles and the concepts apply to teens. And um, I'm teaching a class on loneliness to teenagers now too. So I've had to really plug into their experiences. And so a couple of things that are harmful in friendships that I, I tend to see in younger folks, though us older folks are totally guilty of it too, is a breakdown in something called mutuality. And our mutual mutuality means that I'm considering your needs and my needs at the same time and acting in a way that fulfills both of our needs to the extent that that's possible, right? So, you know, just an example of a breakdown of this, right? There's someone that I interviewed for the book and she was supposed to go to her friend's dance recital. She ends up getting sick. She can't go to the recital. You know, she has some mysterious illness. She's in and out of the hospital. She tells her friend this. Her friend says, you're a horrible friend. Why did you miss my recital? And that is, even though that friend was hurt and it's valid to be hurt when your friend can't show up, if you're engaged in mutuality, you're not just thinking about your perspective. I'm hurt, my friend didn't show up. You're also considering, hey, what is going on for them, right? And if they are in a place where they have a lot going on for them, I can extend more grace because of mutuality. I'm not just thinking about getting my needs met, but I'm also thinking about meeting their needs too. So that I think is one of the the biggest problems that defines friendships, I guess, that you could consider toxic. There's one person who's thinking about getting their needs met all the time and isn't thinking about the other person's needs or being considerate to what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, that's so good. Um, okay. I, for some reason, was thinking that your, your book was geared toward teens. Um, but I, I'm glad that it's geared toward adults because I feel like it, it'll be such an interesting read because I don't have teens yet. Um, but it's so good to like, even just know the research and the statistics behind the teens and the mental health and why it's so important to help our kids build community in that way. Um, I'd love to, if you're open to it, to talk about the, again, you were saying letting go of friendships. Uh, yeah. earlier. So kind of the friendship breakup, because um, 
I feel like I never really had to go through that until I was an adult. And then it ended up being like one of the hardest things that I ever went through and how that can, as you were saying before, kind of actually build confidence. Um, but just kind of have touching on friendship breakups. Cause I feel like even in adulthood, that can be really hard when you've had a significant friendship or a really long lasting friendship. And obviously as you get older, sometimes things grow apart, you value different things. Um, and some of it can be what you were saying before, like the, um, what was the term that you used for what we just talked about? Uh, when oh, mutuality, mutuality, mm-hmm. um, and things like that. So I'd love for you to kind of touch on breakups. Yeah, this is a good question. Oof. First of all, I empathize with anyone going through a friendship breakup because I think for for a lot of us, when we've had a friend for a while, we kind of just assume that we're going to stay friends for a while. And it, in a way that's unique, I think. Like I think in romantic partnerships, there's an acknowledgement that things end. We go in and out of these romantic partnerships. Divorce happens, but because friendship is sort of a often a less intense relationship, we're not seeing each other all the time. It's like, we can keep this going, even if it's not really perfect all the time, you know? And I think in that way, people can really take friendship breakups personally, because it's like, well, you can keep like 30 friends going and you still couldn't even keep me in your life. And so there are, I think, not that one is easier or harder, but I will say there are specific liabilities that come with friendship breakups. One of them being, we don't even know how to do it, right? There's just no script. Like you might know how to break up with someone in a romantic relationship, but when it comes to friendship, it's like, do I ghost? Do I back away? Do I sit them down? Like what how the heck do I navigate this? What is it? How do I do this fairly? You know, and even for me as a French expert, this is a dicey topic because I've asked people on my Instagram, like, would you rather someone just be busy endlessly or would you rather them address this with you? Um, And the responses were really, really split. And I think it depends on the depth of the relationship. If this Mm -hmm. is a new friendship, you can try to go some of these indirect routes. If it's an established friendship, you are going to want to address it because if you don't, you trigger something called ambiguous loss. And that is a complicated grief that happens when we don't have closure or meaning as to why something ended. So it gets a lot harder for us to to process it. So if you're not actually telling your friend why you want to break up with them, they're probably going to go through a more complicated grief process. So I would suggest that you tell your friend if they're close to you and if they still want to be friends with you, right? Um, If they don't want to be friends with you, you know, I think you could both go your separate ways, but just, just tell them like, Hey, you know, I really wanted to talk about our friendship sometime. Would you be open to this? And, and when you have that conversation explaining your side, and that's just explaining how you felt in the friendship, not what they've done wrong. Like I felt that we're not connected less or we don't have the same values or, you know, I've kind of felt been fit, feeling a little disappointed or let down when there's been times that I really needed support um, and I didn't hear from you, right? And sharing, you know, that you want to end, that this is leading you want to end the friendship, but you can also do something called creating a commemorative friendship, which means you can acknowledge that you did, there was value in this friendship and that there were good things that happened. And I think we all, it's a disservice to all of us when we look at any friendship that ended as a waste, right? Because we take that lens and it leads us to, to kind of ignore all the positive memories, the positive experiences, the ways that being in this friendship changes us. And those two things can be true at the same time. It ended and it also gave us something. So a commemorative friendship means acknowledging, but I did want to acknowledge like that, that, you know, there was this time when we were really close and I really valued when you did this. And this is a memory that like, I'll continue to cherish. And so I do really, really appreciate that. Um, but then after the friendship, you can expect something called disenfranchised grief after the friendship ends. And that basically happens when we're grieving something that other people don't see as a legitimate thing to grieve about, right? Like when when people go through miscarriages, when um, they lose pets, when they lose friends, disenfranchised grief can occur where you have trouble coming to terms with this grief because people around you aren't acknowledging that it's actually a hard loss and we heal from our grief through getting support from other people and having that validation from other people. So that's why I think friendship endings can feel so hard to grieve because everyone else is like, 
why does this matter so much to you? And you're like, this actually really is, does matter a lot to me. And you're, you might be struggling to invalidate yourself and be like, why am I having this strong reaction? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so good. And, and I agree, like with the romantic stuff, it is easier because I feel like even if there isn't like specific closure, it's easy to be like, it wasn't meant to be. There's somebody mm-hmm. better. There's, exactly. you know, that wasn't my mate. That wasn't going to be my person, but with friendships, it is so different. Cause it's like, it's not like, oh, there's going to be someone better. There's going to be, you know, it's just that <laughs> yeah. you've had this deep, meaningful connection with somebody for so long and shared so much with them and gone through stages of life with them. And then, you know, disruption happens, whatever happens. And that it's like, holy crap, like, how do you move on from that? And that, that was definitely way harder than any breakup I've ever been through in my life was losing a friend. And, and I agree there is like that thing where people don't understand it. It's like, okay, well, this happened. Obviously you're not great friends anymore. So move on. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, (laughs) but I love what you said, just like kind of having those, um, memories of being like, okay, I can still validate that season of friendship and have the good memories. And, uh, and knowing that it, we're moving on in different directions now and that's fine. Yeah. And, and I just want to emphasize it's very normal for friendships and every seven years we lose about half our friends. So yeah. we are all going through it. And if you lost friends, a friend, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong with them. This is just sort of a normal part of our evolution through life. That's interesting that uh, every seven years thing. Yeah, right? Isn't it wild? That's so wild. It makes sense like, because some friends you get at work and then you change jobs or exactly. you, you know, things like that. I've definitely had that um, where you just kind of end up losing touch. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the most common way the friendship ends. People just lose touch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's so interesting. Well, thank you for talking about the breakup thing. I haven't had sure. anyone on here talk about that really before either. And I do think that it is a, a part that, that happens in life that we don't really talk about and you're expected to have heartbreak from uh, romantic relationships and different things like that, but not necessarily in friendship. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know anyone going through it. It's hard. I'm sorry. I empathize. Your grief is valid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'd love for you to touch more on your book. Um, because I know you say like the science of attachment can help you make and keep friends. And I know we kind of talked about the attachment of outside of, um, like when you have that secure attachment, whether it's like at home or in community, you have more of that. Is there any more like science type stuff that, that you can share with that? Yeah. So taking a step back, I think the larger thesis of the book is the idea that how we've connected has fundamentally shaped our personalities. If you are trusting, open, friendly, warm, you have had likely had positive experiences of connection. If you are cynical, um, distrusting, insecure, struggle with low self-esteem, um, that means that you've probably had some difficult experiences of connection. So our personalities, yeah, they're, they're part genetic, but they also reflect our experiences of connection fundamentally. But then to bring things full circle, who we are affects how we connect, right? We, when we become this, like, I guess, self-protective person where we distrust people, we're very cynical, we're closed off, we're never vulnerable, then we go out into the world unable to connect with people as well. Um, when we've had these positive experiences of connection, we felt loved, we're open, we're warm, we're friendly, we're welcoming towards others we can trust. We go out into the world and we have a set of qualities that help us continue to flourish in building connection, right? And so this is, this is like the science of attachment theory too. Attachment theory argues your previous experiences of connection create a template that you then use to evaluate new experiences, new relationships that you have in the world. And because our relationships are so ambiguous, we, we don't actually know, do you actually like me or do you hate me? Like our, the, our template is just what we use most of the time to evaluate social events that are happening 
in front of us. And so, you know, how we're evaluating the world is, is very much a reflection of ourselves. And so achieving security, I, I talk about like different traits that you would develop if you had this sort of healing experiences of connection and that you can still develop and that I'm trying to help you develop in the book that are also going to help you make friends. So their initiative, vulnerability, authenticity, productively talking about anger, um, affection towards other people, and generosity. Those are the traits. The traits that, and you will, I guess you'll just notice in these traits, I think a lot of us, when we think about making friends, we're thinking about ourselves. How can I come off as likable, cool, impressive? But the traits that make us friends are the traits that orient us towards other people. They are the traits that make us think about how do I make other people feel like they're welcomed? How do I make other people feel like they belong? And the consequences of that is I belong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so good. I'm definitely gonna have to check it out. Um, for those listening, where can they find, follow you, grab your book? Uh, cause I know this is going to come out right around when you're releasing it. Um, so where can they get all of that information at? Yeah. So, um, on my Instagram, you can follow me for tips on friendship. That's at Dr. Marissa G. Franco, M-A-R-I-S-A-G-F-R-A-N-C-O. On my website, you can sign up for a quiz to assess your friendship strengths and weaknesses or hire me to speak on connection and belonging. That's Dr. Marissa G. Franco.com. And the book is called platonic how the science of attachment can help you make and keep friends and it's available wherever books are sold awesome i want to thank you so much for coming on and for sharing all of your tips uh and valuable information with us and i cannot wait uh for your book to come out so thank you so much for your time and energy and expertise with us today thank you so much for having me i hope that teens can make friends <laughs> a little easier <laughs> after this <laughs> well yeah and even just that parents can help like after hearing this be like, oh, okay, like maybe I've noticed this or, oh, my, my kid really isn't in a community or in a place where they can foster those relationships or even that assuming that people like you, that's such good information. Like just that little tip of telling your kid that I think yes. it goes such a long ways. Exactly. And one other tip that I, I didn't touch on that I just wanted to share. Um, when we think about making friends, we have to overcome something called overt avoidance, which means overt avoidance is I'm scared of people. I'm not going to show up. So we have to show up, but mm. we also have to overcome something called covert avoidance. Covert avoidance is I show up, but I'm checked out. I'm just on my phone. I'm talking to the one person I already know, you know, I'm just waiting for people to approach me, you know, it's, it's showing up physically, but checking out mentally. And so encourage yourself or your kids to overcome covert avoidance by, yeah, when you start up for the soccer game, make sure you introduce yourself to someone and say, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Johnny. Like, how long have you been a part of this league, for example? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, hey, don't you sit across from me in algebra? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. To just take that initiative um, mm -hmm. when they're around other people and don't just wait for people to approach them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so good. Well, thank you again so much for coming on. I will leave all of the links where people can follow you, get your book and take that quiz at uh, in the show notes. So make sure that you guys check that out. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. This was thank so much fun. You.